stuff like the forecasting stuff that was due, those problems, any of them you want to yes. go over or review. So when it was fitting the best line, it kind of broke it into those 
to those two groups. It's one way to conceptualize it. And that's kind of what he runs into here. So this is the graph deck that I was thinking of. Uh, that's the one I think of when we're talking. So um, does it matter whether we give the one to the residential or to the non-residential? Is that going to make a difference? So if I say all the residentials get a one and non-residential gets a zero, and then I run my results, and that's what this was. If I now change my data around and give the non-residentials a one and the residentials a zero, should I get a different result? Does, in other words, does it matter who I give the one to? It shouldn't matter, right? Because we're just, again, trying to signal one or the other. So it shouldn't matter, and it doesn't matter, but you do get different results. So that's what this last section was showing, but that now the baseline um, changes because we're giving a one to the non-residential, and so then the adjustment here, the coefficient, if you ran the regression, would be a plus 3.03706 instead of a negative 3.03706. So everything else would stay the same. And then, so that's where your interpretation comes in. Uh, with this one, residential, and they, they say this in here somewhere, residential people buy three less pizzas on average per month. The negative three means you're buying three less per month. Okay, questions on that? So, just wanted to review that one, see if there's anything that dropped any uh, discussion. Um, if you have multiple dummies, then you're still kind of always, you'll have two dummy variables in your regression, and the one that's not there is the alternative, that's just the intercept. So, just like we did with the one zero case, one is the not that if the zero is non-residential, then that one stays the same. If you have three dummy variables, then you're going to have the baseline case for that. And I think we're going to see that in this next exercise we're going to do. All right. So if you got your books, pull them out. We're going to get into the next material. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, This week, we start week six. And week six deals with the appendix um, material. So we got this case at the back that we're going to start today to get you started on it. And it has another app. We've got the week six test. And you're not going to do the paper thing. So everything's due but the paper. Are we going to do those like this week? Yeah. So next week we're going to start backtracking on the other, where we left off in week five where I said ignore the paper thing. We're going to start bringing the paper stuff back into it. Okay. But for this week, ignore the paper. So no paper stuff, basically. Uh, just ignore the paper stuff like we did last week with the other thing. And then week seven. Uh, we have one exercise we're going to start, and then we're going to—I'm going to start to add in paper due dates to build up that. Okay, questions there? Then you guys are going to go, go, go like gangbusters and focus on your paper. All right. So um, turn to your books. We're going to do a little round robin reading again. So turn to your appendix, and this is that wine example. Does everybody have a book? Okay, everybody's got a book. Okay, you guys are sharing. I'll I'll put it up here too, but yeah, if you guys can pass it to each other. All right. So the author did did some actual consulting work with the wine industry, and so we're working from the data uh, that that he had there, and. We're going to actually kind of dig our hands into, it's like starting from scratch, ultimately is where we're going, is starting from scratch on doing an analysis on the wine industry. 
And so this is going to really hopefully prep you for your analysis. You're going to do some different ways as far as using Excel to kind of approach your problem and analyze the data. All right, so I'll start off with this first paragraph, and then Alex, why don't you take and we'll just kind of round robin roughly paragraphs uh, as we go. This appendix provides the demand analysis using actual data on consumer purchases for specific types of wine. The appendix has three parts. The first, the first, first, the analysis and the results are discussed without specific reference to how those results were obtained. Next, we show how the analysis is performed in Excel. Finally, extensions to the analysis are suggested using the data provided. Uh, as noted in Chapter 5, the data obtained from companies like Lacey Nielsen and Information Resources are highly proprietary in nature. Fortunately, the author of this section was given permission by IRI to use selected historical data on the wine industry extracted from its InfoScan reviews. InfoScan data is provided using four week time periods, 13 periods per year. For this analysis, we shall track sales in five wine categories or types over 52 time periods from 1996 to 1999 in the Los Angeles food market. Five statistics are given for each observation. Dollar sales, volume, volume sales, unit sales, average price per unit, and all commodity value. ACB weighted distribution. Unit sales counts the number of bottles sold regardless of bottle size. Volume sales is equivalent on nine liter cases. Readers can download this data from the, from the demand with seasonality of Excel. Yeah, Jake. Uh, ideally, we'd like to calculate demand for a specific wine, for example, Mon, Cove, Napa, Group, Prestige. Such an analysis would include information regarding Mon substitutes such as Domain, Chandon, and Type versus Sonoma. We could easily accomplish this task with more detailed data that is available for AP from IRA. Indeed, the author has done conducted that analysis proceeding. The data used in this appendix are more aggregated. Information is provided on great varieties and specific brands of, of those varieties. Given aggregated data, or aggregated data, the most effective demand analysis will occur for the variety that is most homogeneous. <coughs> Zinfandel fits the bill. Simply put, there is not much price or perceived quality dispersion between various brands of white Zinfandel, producers of white Zinfandel. They just dispute this, but greater quality and price dispersion exists for other three great varieties. White Zinfandel is most likely a commodity. As can be seen in Figure 5A1, unit sales of white Zinfandel Q are flat across the four year sample provided by I. Each year has a noticeable peak during Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. About 30 times each year. Okay, stop stop there. 5A1, let's take a look at it. So 5A1 is on the next sheet. So 96, 97, 98, 99. So there's our four years. And then we've got the sales on the vertical axis, and then we've got these noticeable peaks. All right, continue on. The four, the four price series in 2 take an interesting path. All four price series exhibit an upward trend in prices for three of their varieties. Yeah, I'm tired all the seconds. Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, and a lot peak during the holidays. The same is not true of White's and Fed, where there's actually a noticeable dip in price during the holidays. And not that I'm a wine snob, but Merlot. So I just told him. <laughs> All right, 582. I'll look at 582 here before we continue on. So we got the observations of each one. So White Zin is the price, PWZ, the price of White Zin, the price of Chardonnay, the price of Cabernet Sauvignon, and the price of Merlot. Okay. Let's see, who's the next, Jism? The scatter plot in figure 5A3 depicts an inverse relation between price and quantity for white zinc. The data cloud has a simple core with peak observations to the right. As noted in Chapter 4, two functional forms are readily available, linear and constant elasticity. Both forms produce reasonable estimates, but the fit is better in coefficient 
the interpretation is easier for the constant elasticity of the demand. Superior fit is not surprising if you consider the CED function depicted in figure 4.1a of the previous chapter. For further discussion of CED estimation, see the non-linearity of the cell app, the CED function, this for the data depicted in figure 5a. Okay, so let's take a look at 5A3. It's not overly obvious. So there's our data all plotted out. And four, well, what did it say? 4A or 41A was the, I think that was our picture of the CD constant elasticity. That's this. So we've got the log log. So when we have a function like this, if we take the logs of it, it straightens it out. Right? That was the concept. So if we have data that seems to follow a curved look to it, then we can do the log log transformation to straighten it out so that we can use ordinary least squares. Jacob, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so, continue on page. The line fit plot from the A regression is spread in order to emphasize the point described in figure 4.1. The easy curve in space in figure 4.1a is linear in space in figure 4.1b. This linearity allows for estimation of these regression analysis. This preliminary regression. Okay, no, you can, you can just look at it. <laughs> but let's let's look at it, right? So the preliminary regression they've already done. So they've transformed by taking the log of the actual quantities, created a new data column, right? That's how that was done. And so the log of the prices, and they have this peak variable. So we get an R squared of 70.79. What is that? What's the interpretation of that? 0.797. Uh, yes, it could be a little more specific. It's overall fit. Yeah, so in fact, we can interpret it with the 0.79 to say 79% of the variation in the dependent variable is explained by the independent variables. Right? So these things move around, and why are they moving around? This model is saying 79% of the movement is captured by these independent variables. So it's kind of a goodness of fit that it's pretty tight. If it was 100%, if the data looked like this and we fit a, a line to it, that would be 100%, right? which is basically impossible. And so when we start to have a line that fits, pretty good, then we've got maybe the 79% of the data is explained. Or if it's a little bit noisier, then maybe it's 60%, maybe it's 38%, whatever. So when you run it each time, that R squared is something to pay attention to on overall goodness of it. Okay, next reader, Alex, why don't you continue? Uh, P is a dummy variable that equals one during each of the 12th and 13th time periods. Each year, otherwise equals zero. Each coefficient is significantly different from zero, and this regression explains nearly 80% of the variance in why sales over this period. The line fit plot from this regression is shown in the year 5 a All right, let's take a look at 5A4. So we've got the predicted line, and then I think this is with that dummy variable. So they gave, notice how they did that. So on the, they just threw a one in there as an extra variable on those peak periods. They just threw a one. And so that shifted the line over here, or it, it gives the same interpretation as a shift variable. That, A, hey, for those peak observations, which are a lot less, notice, right? then this line fits better during the peak periods. And so it turned out to be significant, the peak 
period is um, there was a different result. All right. Uh, Jake. Uh, this shows two lines of predicted LN QWZ squares in LNQ, LNQ space as expected, given that a dummy variable has been added to unit variate equation. Peak sales are approximately 50% higher than optimum sales, and all else have constant. The inner line is predicted <coughs> off peak sales, and the outer line is predicted peak sales. This simplified model is not the preferred model, but is provided to help explain the linearity inherent in CD functions in the log log format. Line tip plots of the preferred model are also linear, but this linearity is obscured in two dimensional diagrams. Okay. Um, so, just as a, um, so everybody knows here, the ln is natural logs. So, we had the log, log, you can do a log function or the natural log, and it just had to deal with the base, base 10 or base e. So, you could do, we had that one exercise where you could go either direction. So, um, there. Various equations are estimated based on the uh, presence of various cross price series in the model. Oh. Uh, time takes on values from 1 to 52. Each regression includes the price of flights and tails. Yeah, because the original price must be included in the demand analysis. Okay, stop there for a sec. So let's look at this equation. We've got the data, and then we've got a variable we're calling time. Right? So that variable is just taking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 52. So they're literally putting that in as a, as a variable, even though it's just moving over time, right? So, and then we have that peak dummy variable. So all of these are kind of shoved in here to try to make some predictions. Okay, continue on. Coefficients and statistics. Each of the weight models are provided together with adjusted R squared and standard estimates in table five group. Each price coefficient in the long, long demand equation price elasticity. Coefficient B is the only price elasticity of demand. C coefficients are price cross price elasticity. Regressions are grouped according to how many cross price independent variables are included in the model. Before discussing the cross price effects, it is worth noting the consistency of the results provided by the independent variables common to all the models. Okay, so let's look at this table. You guys are going to need to do a table similar to this for your papers. You'll see this in other papers that you review. And so we've got 1, 2, A through D here. These are the eight models that they ran. So each one of these were different runs of the regression, right? So where they tweaked different things. And so in this model, C, they didn't put in the price of Chardonnay, right? They put in the price of Cabernet. That's why this variable shows up here but not here. So for each of the models we did, we threw in this. So the first model, A, we just have the price of whites in it, right? We didn't do anything else. We got the time and the peak variable. And then the second model, we added Chardonnay. The third model, we deleted Chardonnay, but added Cabernet, all the time keeping whites in it, right? Which is the own price elasticity. And then for the third model, or the fourth model, we deleted uh, sharp, uh, cab, but added in the Merlot, and then here we threw in both. Here we put in these two, here we put in these two, and here we put in all three. Right, so we kind of did multiple runs. You might not do all of those variations because uh, it might not be appropriate. They're kind of doing it here to, to show um, some things going on with the, with the variables. Okay, questions on that so far? So when we start to analyze well, which one's the best, one place to start to check would be on your R squared, and this is adjusted R squared. Does anybody remember what adjust, the adjusted R squared did? What was it adjusted for? Yeah. So if we add new variables, what happens to the regular R-squared? 
it always goes up. So that one exercise that you guys had that added junk, a junk variable, you remember that one? We just added a variable, I think he called it garbage. And he just made up numbers, or you can make up numbers. If you add that variable garbage to the model, R squared is going to go up. It usually goes up by very little if it had nothing to do with the, with the model. So the adjusted R squared kind of uh, takes that into account, the number of variables that you're throwing into it. So that's one thing to look at. Where, where is R squared the, the highest? Uh, and then we can start to look at some of the other um, variables and their uh, significance. So in your papers, your, your papers, a common way to do this, there's kind of a couple different ways that you'll see, but so in model F, the coefficient on the price of Chardonnay was 2.42, and the T stat was 2.77. So it was significant at the uh, probably the five percent level of significance. So we we'll get into all of those details, but. Um, I wrote this down here because you'll see in some of your papers when, when you have tables or during your literature review, it'll show that this variable was significant with one star, this variable maybe was significant with two stars. And so um, what that means is it's at the 5% level of significance, which is usually kind of the standard in economics, is that we'll say a variable is, is significant if it meets the standard mean at the 5% level. So I'm the 95% confidence level, right? I'm 95% confident that the, the actual variable lies in this interval, right? So we feel pretty good about the, the significance of the coefficient. Whereas this one's under two, 1.87 is actually under the rule of two but if you go to the tables and you actually look, that is significant at the 10% level. So you'll see, the only reason I point this out is you'll see that maybe reported in some of your papers. And that's that's what it means. So it's 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 a little weaker, it's still showing some significance, um, but you might not get into a top tier journal with, with that one. If you're trying to solve the world's problems and you came up with a 10% significant variable, and let's say that was your key variable to your whole paper, it's a it's a weaker argument, okay. but it, but it's still something. And sometimes they'll include that in there just so we can see. And that this way, when you publish in peer-reviewed journals, it's mostly other economists that are reading this, and then maybe some economic students, right? The general public isn't reading these things. And so by creating a table like this, other researchers can read what you're interpreting the data as. And say, oh, well, what about this? And they can kind of pick you apart potentially. So we tr intentionally, being kind of more science minded, report the larger part of the results. Sometimes we do that in the appendix. Um, we might have extra things because we don't want it to detract from the, you know, whatever you're trying, the point you're trying to make with the data. Um, but nonetheless, we'll we'll still add that in sometimes. So you're going to see that in maybe this is a all right, questions on that? And these tables are a pain in the butt, so prepare yourself. Um, it is not acceptable for you to just grab onto the Excel output and dump that into your paper. So you need to set it up on uh, this type of format, because this is, this is the standard way um, we do the reporting. Jack. Um. So they have quite a few models here. That's because they have quite a few variables in there. Yeah. So where we don't have that comparison. Uh, yeah, and, you, and again, you don't have to do it the way they did it here, where they kind of did plus and minus some of them. Usually you do this for your key variables. So if you're looking at crime, and there's a couple of uh, crimes due to AK uh, or AR-15s, and crimes due to handguns or something, and that's your story of crime or something then you might want to do this type of analysis with that on your key variables. But if you've got some other variables that are just like, oh, I don't know, gender or something like that, some dummy variables that maybe aren't quite as relevant to whatever you're trying to explain, then you might not do like show every run of every possible scenario. Because you're going to have a pretty big paper. You're going to get up to seven variables. We show every possible permutation. 
and it's going to get kind of ugly, and I don't want that. It's, you're not doing it for, for that purpose. So. But you are taking the um, Excel output, which you guys are familiar with, um, and putting it into some sort of format like this. By the way, you wouldn't normally do, you wouldn't include this. Um, usually, you're going to get the feel for it when you look at some of your other papers, but it's usually down to the coefficients and then the T stats. You would include the R squared or the. Typically not here, no. Okay. I mean, you might find a few papers that do that, but, so, but this is just kind of included here more for educational purposes. So kind of use your papers as kind of a lead for your particular thing. All right, uh, any other last questions there? So, where do we leave off here? Where did we leave off? Lost. Are we on model A on Yeah, did we finish in yeah, model A? Okay. Is that where we are? Yeah. All right. Who's up? Okay. Model A example of preliminary regression discussed above by including a time counter to test for the trend. The coefficient of time, T e equals 0.01, implies an annual growth rate of 0.8% per year, all else but constant. The other models imply an annual growth between 1.7% and 0.8%. The T statistic for the coefficient of that each model suggests that sales of white to new are flat. The trait that is apparent in model A is due to the lack of cross price information in the model. In all specifications, demand for white to new sale is a lot like price and own price elasticity on a ranging from Okay, okay, pause there for a sec. So let's go, let's kind of look at that. Where, where are they getting at? Go back to the table, and the coefficient for the first model is 1.82. So this is part of the reason that we use the, the, the model this way, is that now we've got the elasticity of demand equal to 1.82. So, what's the interpretation of that? How would you write that in your paper? What's our trick? Put it over one. Put it over one. Nope. They're spread in the wrong direction. Start with the other one. For every 1% change in, and I'd rather not use the word change, but a 1% increase in, to be specific now, okay, price of whites in leads to 1.82% decrease in the price of, uh, it's not the price, no, it's not on the other three, it's the quantity. Quantity of sales. And it's the sales were in units that we did. So now we're, used, we're able to just pluck off these coefficients and we've got instantly elasticities, which is good. That's kind of the nice part about this. So in here they said it ranged from 1.82 to 2.36. So 2.36 is B. 2.1, 1.89, 2.34, 2.36, 2.07, and 2.35, right? So that's, they just reported that the elasticity ranged between that for all of the models. Um, and then you might, for, for your paper, you might be saying something like, our preferred model, due to whatever reason, um, we think the elasticity is this, so you might not report the range or whatever. Just, uh, just a coefficient. The 
Uh, I think it's the advantage of the natural log, if I remember right, that that gives you the elasticity. Yes. And that's in that chapter, and I always just, like, we tend to just use natural logs always for that reason, and I think that's the reason. <laughs> Uh, but I can't remember exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I would. So watch uh, the coefficient for model A. That's what I was doing here when I did this. Model A: 1.82, 2.36, C, D, E, F, G, H. So it ranges. We got different values. But the range was 1.82 to 2.36. Okay. Anything else? All right, continue on. The 95% confidence interval on a coefficient represents that range of values over which that individual coefficient is likely to occur. The 90% confidence interval on B represents the range of likely values. Of in each model, the 95% confidence interval does not include negative one. We are confident in our belief that the demand for white and male is elastic. Peak demand is approximately 40% higher than off peak demand in each specification. The range of proportional increases is 38% to 43%. Okay. So, again, picking that up, interpreting. So the 95%, um, they don't actually do the confidence in the book here, I don't think. But any questions on the idea of that 95% confidence interval? You guys have that as output on your regression that you got from Excel, right? You get that 95% confidence interval. And so that would be, if that 95% confidence interval was including one, then we couldn't really say that it's for sure elastic. So remember the, along the linear demand curve, if we go back to the, the old basics, the unitary elastic, the elastic range, and the inelastic range, right? And so now we've estimated that coefficient at 1.82, and so we're testing to see whether that 95% confidence interval, what's the range that it does? If it came down here, if, if, if it was kind of a weak um, positive, or if possibly the estimate instead of being 1.82 was 1 1.2, right? And the 95% confidence interval included the one, then we couldn't really necessarily say that we knew for sure it was elastic. Okay, questions on that? So that's the use of those. And so the tighter the tighter the fit, the higher the T-square, the narrower that 95% band will be, right? So it might be, even if you got a 1.2, maybe it ranges between 1.15 and 1.25 or something like that. So it's pretty tight to it, depending on the goodness of the bill. And we get that from the T, from the T-step. Okay, anything else there? Uh, continue on. Models B through D include a single cross tie suspended by the variable offering a positive coefficient for C, meaning that all are substituted for white system. Model B is the best of the group because of the high indices assisted of the cross prime variable, highly or high adjusted R squared, and low standard error of estimate. This result is also reasonable from a market perspective, showing that the white line is reasonable to assume that the opposed substitute for white system bill, neither Cabernet Sauvignon nor Merlot is a full prime line. Okay, so let's pause there. So models B through D include the single cross price elasticity. So that's where we started doing this. So all of them are positive. So that means they're substitutes or complements. So cross price elasticity. So the cross price elasticity. Percentage change in. Yeah, complements, percentage change in the price of Cabernet. So if this is white Zin, the quantity of white Zin and the Cabernet, if there's an increase in the price of Cab, 
Do I buy more cab or less cab? If there's an increase in the price of Cabernet, sorry, I said the wrong thing. If I increase the price of Cabernet, do I buy more white Zin or less? More if, if there's substitutes, right? So if there's an increase in the price of Cab, then I'm not going to buy Cab, I'm going to buy white Zin, right? If there's substitutes. So that's a positive relationship which means we should be looking for a positive coefficient. So we're now doing a hypothesis test to say, hey, are these two things complements or substitutes, right? Our gut feeling going into the research might have been, oh, they got to be substitutes. You know, but maybe for some reason, people always tend to buy one wine with the other one. Maybe they're complements. And so the degree of substitutability is what the author's next talking about, interpreting 1.16, 0 0.62, 0 0.20. So which one is the weakest substitute? Or low? And we go back to our interpretation. A 1% increase in the price of Merlot leads to a 0.2% decrease, oops, sorry, increase, positive sign, increase in the quantity of white sand. But Chardonnay, we get a 1.16%, right? So those people are really exchanging those <coughs> more. They're exchanging probably one or the other, but people in general tend to substitute Chardonnay more than the other. Okay, now, um, in this model, what does this t-stat tell you about our point two? It's, just, it's not significant from zero. So that means this is not correct. You would never do this interpretation in your paper for that. Our data says that it's insignificant. So now we don't think there is a relationship between the, that for substitutes or complements. Our data doesn't, it doesn't suggest that. Now, maybe it's because we haven't collected enough data, right? So we're not necessarily saying we solved the world's problem. Like, I've proved, this is where I want you guys to avoid your paper, I've proved that Merlot and White's Inn are not substitutes. I've proven that. You haven't proved squat, right? You found some data that suggests, given your circumstances, out of Los Angeles, from 1996 to 1999, your data suggests that they're not. But you haven't proved any. Okay? But watch the prove word. All right, did I see a hand up? Yeah, a couple of The only one you could use would be the Chardonnay. It's the only one that's significant. Correct. That's my question. Yeah, that was your question too. Okay. So, like the entire category of the the entire column is all worse. Yeah. So, look at what happens when we put all three in. Now this one starts to actually get closer to being significant. It might be close to that 10% level or something, right? It's climbing close to two. But what was the issue when you do this? It begins with an M. That's a long word that's weird and unique to economics or econometrics. Multicollinearity. Yes, that's the problem of multicollinearity. So, um, you might start to find that. So, um, and that's when you see signs jumping around. That's a good indication of it. Like this is a positive sign, and then it goes to a negative. Or if they're switching signs, that's positive, that's positive, but that's all negative. Right? The computer's like confused. Like these things are all moving around together, so it's like jumping around uh, and not being very reliable. Okay, keep reading. Who's up next? Uh, models E through G include two cross-price independent variables. In this, instant, in this instant, one acts as a substitute, the other acts as a complement to white zinfandel. male. But only in model F are both statistically significant. Merloy is significant at the 10% level. Model F is the best specification table 5A.1. It has the highest adjusted R squared and lowest standard error of estimate of all regressions in the table. Chardonnay is a substitute and Merloy is a complement to white Zinfandel in this specification. Okay, so they're 
We're looking to model F being the, the best model here. And we do have this negative coefficient on the Merlot and positive on uh, the Chardonnay. All right, uh, next reader. The final specification, model H, includes three cross prices as well as the price of whites in the Comparing models F and G with H provides a nice example of a multi linearity model. As it is visually clear for figure 5A2, Chardonnay, Cabernet, Savion, and Marlowe prices track one another quite closely. This is especially apparent during peak periods and under the month. This is confirmed by the correlation provided in table 5A2. Chardonnay, Cabernet, or Chardonnay, Cabernet Savion, Mar and Marlowe are all highly familiar for correlation coefficients between 0.975 and 0.988. These prices are also correlated with White and Zinfandale prices, the correlation is not high. Putting highly correlated independent variables in a regression model produces the multi-linearity problem discussed in Chapter 5. Estimating coefficients vary in magnitude and lose significant rel significance relative to models where fewer collinear variables are included. Notice, for instance, the Cabernet Savion's coefficients uh, change sign between G and H due to the addition of pricing information on Chardonnay. But another way, the introduction of Cabernet pricing and moving from, H, or from F to H involves both Chardonnay and Merlot coefficients to be less significant produced by T statistics. Even though H uses more ex explanatory variables, it does a less accurate job of prediction as signified by the lower adjusted R2 and higher SEDA of H relative to F. In conclusion, F is the preferred model of demand for white sin given the data available to us from IRI. Okay, so now to the point that's your homework here. So, using Excel to perform the regression analysis. A number of available statistical software packages are available to perform regression. In this section, we're going to demonstrate how the most readily available generic software package, Excel, uh, can also be used to perform this task. The data used to perform the data, uh, this analysis are located in the data sheet of the Demand with Seasonality app. So that's one of our, our sections. Five columns of data are provided with each of the five, uh, five line app uh, types. Table, uh, Chardonnay, Merlot, all of them listed. As noted above, we focus on comparison unit sales uh, when performing the separate analysis. So we convene, uh, this worksheet is called Data Reg. In the section of the appendix, boldface letters refer to Excel names or command and italic characters refer to information, labels, or numbers of equations. You will need to type into cells. Uh, italics are also used when clicking or dragging is required. If you want to try doing this here, analysis yourself, i.e. that's what you're going to do, uh, open your own blank document by clicking a new blank document on the standard toolbar. Then try to create a file that looks like Appendix 5. Copy the entire data worksheet uh, to the new workbook by opening up the new file and then going back to the data worksheet. Highlight the entire worksheet. So he's telling you word for word what to do to get down to creating the data. Highlight the individual columns, click E, data work. Okay, so the rest of all of this text is you guys going through and doing this analysis from scratch, not just reading it and having it all done. Now, it's all there for you to track along with. Um, oops. So this is the data on the Excel spreadsheet. So you guys have access to this. So what they're saying is take a new sheet and just grab this data. This is what your paper is going to look like. You're going to have all the answers, so you can go back and double check your work. But trust me, go through this problem. Work it on your own diligently, and then this is going to help you out. Because this is what you're going to be staring at with your paper. Just this. And you're going to be like, oh, crap, what do I do? Right? So you've got unit sales. That's our quantity of whites in. Price of whites in. Price of Chardonnay. Price of Cab. Price of Merlot. That's it. You're starting from that spot. And then work through what he's got in the book to create the rest of all this stuff. Okay? And then there's some uh, questions here at the end on the question tab.
All right, that is it. That's this week's stuff. Yeah, that and anything else in week six, except for anything that's related to the paper. Got it. No, a week from today. Oh, this is doing. Yeah. But you may not want to wait that long. Uh, Wednesday night might not be a good time. Yeah, there's a test, and we yeah, already did it. I thought that was good. Oh, perfect. Oh, there you go. Now you're ahead. Well, hey, you're actually ahead for once. <laughs> now I'm going to catch up on all Ah, uh, Jacob, did you get my. You're always bad with your emails. Uh, check this morning. I don't have. No, my picture. I asked. I sent a an email.